Well, I'm Barney, uh, Barney Hanlon, and I was asked before we kicked off, what's that from? And so I'll just clarify that I am a massive Battlestar Galactica fan. Uh, if you don't know the series, uh, well, no questions from you until you answer that. Uh, so firstly, um, yeah, t today's a very special day for me. And this is not only my first ever talk at the conference, but it, it's my 10th conference. Um, which, when I look back, actually feels really amazing. Um, and I'd like to thank PHP Southwest, uh, especially, because last month they invited me up to give this talk. Uh, so I got a lot of really good positive feedback from them, um, and they were lovely. Um, and if you want to do speaking and come up here, I don't think you'll need to do nine conferences before you attempt it, but uh, I would recommend that you go to PHP Bristol and practice your talk and then come up here. So uh, what do I do? Um, well, the sharp-eyed amongst you might have noticed this little logo on here, and as my manager is in the front there. Uh, so I work for World First. Uh, we are foreign currency and payment specialists. So transferring euros to dollars, pounds, whatever you want around the world. And there's 60 of us in IT, developers, DevOps, infrastructure. Oh, I forgot QAs. They will kill me. Um, <laughs> none of my stories are getting through now. Um, <laughs> uh, guess what? Probably like a lot of people here, we're hiring. Um, so uh, I work as a developer, um, specializing in mentoring internally on better practices, uh, improving code, uh, and so forth. And my team love me. They've shortened how they describe me as the Dementor. So anyhow, um, it's a great company to work for, but it's not without problems. Um, we had huge growth, um, which led to uh, developers sticky taping on more and more to a monolith. Um, and then we've, we've obviously identified that, and we start to try and solve that. But finance, fintech, uh, is a rapidly changing market. There's a lot of deregulation happening, a lot of new products out there. And we have to be competitive or beat our comp competition as well. Um, on top of the changes in uh, the regulations, there's also needs to be more compliant, be aware of security changes. And when you have a monolith, that becomes obviously very heavy to make any changes, so, you know, refactor all the things. Um, so we started coming up with some solutions in 2016 towards this. Start moving with a domain-driven design approach, uh, moving more to micro-ish services, and adopting TDD and BDD everywhere. Um, I don't think that's groundbreaking by any means. I think most people have tried that or are doing that themselves. And it's not the answer to everything. We still have some problems. Um, with new products comes a lot of changes in the domain logic. Um, we adopted the Spotify model. Um, who here is familiar with the Spotify model? OK, a few hands. Uh, actually, not that many hands. Hands up if you hate audience participation. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so we, we started to sp split up the squads and give them more uh, independence, but what that starts leading to is uh, a fracturing in frameworks, a uh, lot more libraries being used as different squads go with a particular approach. And that's great, but it also means that you're having to learn a new framework if you move squad. Um, it also means that because the squads are sort of working independently and choosing a lot of ways to do stuff themselves, we start having like a zillion internal endpoints for our APIs, um, which is OK, but then you start having to just learn another squad's JSON. Uh, this is perhaps my favorite ever recruiter's email to me. Um, unfortunately, uh, it does become a thing that you become a JSON programmer. Um, <laughs> so um, we started to think about this uh, last year and how are you going to solve this. And so uh, quoting the great philosopher Vanilla Ice, uh, 
all right, stop, collaborate and listen. He then went on to say that he was back with a brand new invention, but uh, we can leave that. Um, but some of the things that he would have sung about as well is that, you know, we're not going to refactor all of these working APIs just so that they have the same framework. It doesn't give us anything. There's tests. There's, you know, if somebody's using Lumen or Laravel because they're masochistic, or they're using Symphony or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I put, I've mentioned that specifically because of a chat last night. Um, but it doesn't matter what your framework is. Um, if it's working, don't replace it. You know, it's, there is no need for a company-wide framework. Um, but we do need to handle a way to all of these different changes and how we're going to get things to uh, work in a certain, in a common kind of way. Um, and we need to plug in this new functionality. We've got new products, and we need to, you know, slot them into these APIs. Um, so we started to think about how we're going to do this, and we came up with a couple of solutions. So we're now going to use command buses to tell our domain that we want to do something. Then we're going to use event buses to inform our domain that something has been done. And then we're going to use action domain responder pattern to control the interaction between the framework and the command bus. So it's really now about how we be commanding. Okay. Problem is, the term is overloaded. If you start thinking about what a command is, if you type command PHP into Google, that would probably bring back a lot of results, none of which would be very useful to you. Um, Gang of Four talk about the command pattern. Um, OK, that's one. Uh, Domain-driven design refers to commands within business processes, when you do domain mapping. And then, of course, another popular one, which was mentioned in the talk just before mine, CQRS. We'll start with CQRS, because whilst all of these patterns are different, they play nicely together, and they're not mutually exclusive. So CQRS is command, query, responsibility, segregation. Um, and the heart of it is this notion that you can use a different model to update information than a model you use to read information. If you, start, if you come from using doctrine, early doctrine usage, you'd probably see that you have like one entity that does everything. You know, it has a uh, column. It's basically mapping to every single column in your tables or, or related table. If you have a user table with 30 bits of information, that entity, entity has 30 private variables or protected variables in the case of uh, doctrine. But you're only going to be using a small subset of those during certain operations. But you've now created this massive one that you have to test and use and make sure it's working. It's not necessarily helpful. Um, it's also not being a single responsibility. It's now everything to do with user. Well, when I'm registering a user, they're not a user. They're a customer or they're a client. I only need maybe an email address and password. Why do I have all of this stuff about their account number? Now, that could be that you just go, oh, well, normalize your database. Uh, potentially, but you're already in this, this place. The thing is to have smaller models that are more related to how you use your app rather than just one supermodel. And along comes the command pattern. Now, um, I couldn't find my Gang of Four book to look up their definition, so I went on the ever-reliable Wikipedia. Um, so it's saying, in object-oriented programming, the command pattern is a behavioral design pattern in which an object is used to encapsulate all information needed to perform an action or trigger an event at a later time. This information includes the method name, the object that owns the method, and values of the method parameters. OK, fair enough. That's a good dictionary description, but in a more helpful kind of way, they're very simple data transfer objects. They don't know how they're going to be used, but only enough information so that they can be used. So enough to complete the command, basically. And if you have this command that you've created, and you have another command that's got the same values, it is equal. Simple value object. I have some code now to show you. So uh, 
the launch vipers command. So it's very simple, got a constructor, some private variables. Uh, it takes the launch time in and creates it as an immutable. And it's got some simple getters. Nothing really useful about it in that sense, apart from its name is quite fixed. It's launch vipers command. It's clear what it does, even if it doesn't know what it's going to do. So if we look at command buses, so there's less on this. The first proper reference I came across this was on the League of Extraordinary Packages. Uh, it's when you combine the command pattern with the service layer. Uh, its job is to take a command object, which describes what the user wants to do, and match it to a handler which executes it. This can help structure your code neatly. I firmly believe, after a year of using it, on that last sentence. It does make your code very neat. Um, there are two libraries that I'm familiar with. I was reminded of one just before this talk, is SimpleBus, which I have excluded from this, which is a bit of a shame. But the one that we'll be using today is Tactician, which is by the League. And another one uh, is called Broadway. Now, Broadway is very interesting because it's actually full event sourcing, which will touch on the periphery of this talk. I use Broadway, and I like it. Um, I think everybody can help by giving them some uh, pull requests with some better documentation, because they have some good examples, but it's not the easiest thing to immediately jump into. Um, but I would certainly recommend it if you want to save your events to a database. And so here's a simple handler. See, we're going to use the deck crew service. Um, and so this is the launch Vipers handler. In the case of out-of-the-box, Tactician will take a uh, command. So it's called launch Vipers command. This is called the launch Vipers handler. It will automatically map the two. Uh, and we have one method, handle, uh, which takes in the command. And it's going to uh, take the deck crew service and tell it to get the birds in the air. Uh, for a given battle star from a flight pod with that squadron. As you can see, it's getting everything that it needs from the command. doesn't need to know about anything else apart from the service that was injected into its constructor. And then tying this all together, oh, there's a lot of code there, actually. Gosh, make a note of that. Uh, so we're going to create Tyrrell's deck gang uh, as the uh, deck crew service. We're going to set up the handler with it. And then we're going to use Tactician's quick start method, and we just say, OK, to make sure that we're explicit about it, the command of that class will go to that handler. Simple map. Then we create a command, and then we say, off you go, handle it, command bus. We don't need to know much about the command bus itself. It's, it's a simple enough map for us and gives us a point of abstraction. Um, Within Tactician, you can also, instead of creating a handler like this, you can also use a PSR11 container so that you can load your handlers in a lazy, uh, lazy load them based on what command comes in. So let's talk about event buses. So that, that's command buses. They're fairly simple. The emission um, is the other side of it. Um, and PHP uh, has certainly had event bus-like structures for some time. Um, probably the first one that I came across was Drupal and its hook system. It's a very simple pub sub system before there were real <laughs> events and listeners. Uh, Zen Framework then took it a little bit further with pre dispatch and post dispatch. Uh, and although it didn't provide as many hooks as Drupal, what it did bring was prioritization, which is an important aspect to event listening. Uh, then Long, somebody wrote SPL Observer, which is there, but I haven't really seen a lot of people use. Um, and then probably the most popular one is the Symphony Event Dispatcher, which you see regularly being used within, I think even PHP Spec and BHAT use it. PHP Unit might use a variation of it. I can't remember. But uh, there is another one coming soon, um, which uh, I'm hoping to finish this year, which... <laughs> <laughs> I've rewritten it three times because I keep, keep coming up with different ideas. Um, the one thing that I'm trying to improve is that uh, all of the uh, event 
dispatchers, and I think the term dispatcher has come from uh, their history within Zen Framework or Symphony as being the, background, uh, the backbone of an MVC system. Uh, League uh, has an event system, they call it Emission, which in some ways sort of correctly helps split the mindset, because otherwise we're, we're not really using events inside MVC in, in the right way, I feel. It's like we, we should call them Emission. We're, set, we're saying, hey, Something has happened. Uh, and Bounce, when I finally finish it, uh, has a queue. So that, because at the moment, all of the systems out there only accept one event at the time, um, which is a, breaks how you want the, the application to flow sometimes. Anyhow, so a very simple event. I rewatched the mini series two nights ago to make sure I got this. Uh, correct. Radio, radiological alarm was triggered event. Um, so we have an inbound Cylon radar, and it has a number of nukes that it's going to launch. Um, and again, we're doing very simple getters. Now we want a listener for this. Now, if it's um, uh, a symphony listener, then it's just a simple callable. So we're going to use invoke on it. Um, and clearly, what we want is we don't want to be hit by nukes. Um, so we're going to have the listener, if there are inbound nukes, we're going to send our Viper to intercept the nukes. Um, and we'll see if we're successful later on. But now we'll set it up. In some ways, it's very similar to how we set up the command bus. As you can see, we, we again, we say to the event bus, in this case, it's the Symphony Event Dispatcher. We're going to add a listener, and we're going to say, OK, you're going to listen on this event. And then we dispatch the event to the event bus. And hopefully, the listener will act and stop the nuke. Um, if you compare them, they're pretty, simple, pr pretty similar, but there are uh, you know, some differences. They're both very simple DTOs. Um, I like to think of them as beautifully dumb. There is almost nothing to test on an event or a command, apart from, I put something in your constructor, can I get that thing out? Um, they should be self-validating, however. You should not be able to create a command or an event with invalid data. There should be something within its constructor that says, hey, you know, uh, in, in some cases, that might be just as simple as type hinting, but it might be that it does a little bit more. Um, the main difference is that you know, commands know or have a one-to-one -one relationship with a single handler, whereas events don't, know, have, don't have that relationship with listeners. They may have, in a very simple ex example here, we have one event with one listener, but there could be n number of listeners, and the names mean nothing at that point. Um, they also don't know anything about the mechanism. There was nothing in there that said, by the way, you're coming from the command line or HTTP or uh, the end of a queue. So their world, the world of a handler and the world of a listener, is basically whatever you put inside the command or the event, um, which makes them extremely easy to test because you, you're in full control of that command or that event. Um, the command bus... Uh, abstracts away the direct link between the command and the handler. You, so you can switch out stuff, but it's still one-to-one. -one. And the event bus's role is to manage a many-to-many -many, uh, relationship because there's nothing stopping a listener listening on n number of events or uh, you know, the, uh, vice versa. So, okay, that's commands and events, but how do we use them? Or what is the advantage of them? So we'll talk briefly about uh, hexagonal architecture. Um, it's also known as ports and adapters. Are people fami familiar with hexagonal architecture? Some, some raised hands. Okay, not enough raised hands, so uh, we will go through this. So, allow an application to be driven equally by users, programs, automated tests, or batch scripts, and to be developed and tested in isolation from its eventual runtime devices and databases. This is by uh, Cockburn, who I believe, well, he was certainly the one that that comes up highest on Google for knowing about this. Anyhow, this, this 
diagram. I'm sure if you've seen hexagonal architecture um, before, you'll be aware of this. But we can see that we have adapters around the edge. So we have UI, test agent, integrations. And we even have it at the other end with our mock database or a real database. So we're in control, and then our application is in the center of that. Um, the nice thing is that the application is beautifully ignorant of the nature of the input device. So what, from a PHP perspective, are those adapters? Well, HTTP. It could be Laravel, Lumen, Symfony, and uh, even Drupal if, if you're using uh, Whiskey. Um, or it could be the command line if you're using Symfony Console or Artisan. Uh, it could be just a queue listener. Or it could be your testing framework. These are all the inputs, and they should be treated as adapters. So when you're using the command pattern, um, here's a, a diagram that basically shows it. You can think of this as your HTTP adapter. And that could be an entire Symfony Flex stack or just you know, a slim micro framework. One, it doesn't really matter. The important thing is your domain logic's way over there. Doesn't know about it. And you use the command bus to communicate with it. Now, why bother? You might think, well, it's just another level of abstraction. What do I gain from it? Can anybody say which CEO said this? Take as long as you need to understand your domain logic before building a working product. Your product can change. Your logic shouldn't. Anyone? No? No CEO has ever said <laughs> <laughs> this. When it comes to writing uh, domain logic, uh, the reality is key people are unavailable. You know, if you go to the head of compliance and you say, can I speak to you about how are we compliant in Singapore? And they say, sure, I've got a slot in my diary in five weeks' time for half an hour. OK, can you delegate that to somebody else? Yeah, they'll be available in three weeks. OK. Well, does that mean that we can't write any code to do with compliance for three weeks? Or could we do the rest of the stuff? You've got to get your app towards the finish line. You need points where you can just say, uh, we'll come back to this. The reality is, is that that's just how it's going to be. Um, you also can't mock something unless you know what it is. Um, you need to know a name. You need to know a method that you're going to say, ah, oh, it will return true, or it will return false, or whatever it might be. So let's take a look at an app without a bus. This is a Launch Vipers controller. So we're going to use the, we'll have an index action. And we're reading from a server request. We're going to get the type of the Viper. We're going to set up a battle star. It's name and number, which I assume would be 75. Um, we're going to uh, read what flight pod it is. We're going to create the launch time as now or, no, sorry, uh, some point in the future. And then we're going to go to the deck crew and say, get the birds in the air. And then we've got some catching for if any of that data is invalid. The thing with this, though, is I'm now doing the same with my console command. Let's say that I want to be able to do this from two sources. So I'm doing the same sort of stuff now. But I'm also then going down to the deck crew and I'm saying, get the birds in the air. OK, this works. Um, but there are some downsides. Apart from the obvious duplication, um, what's happening now is we knew some things. We knew that we were going to use a deck crew service. And we knew that the deck crew service had a method on it. So we were already done a little bit of exploring of our domain. OK? Um, but if we don't know anything up front, then we're having to wait to get at least that bit of information. Mm, OK, that's, that's great. If you know a little bit about your domain, perfect. Um, if you have an unexplored domain, then here's the command controller. We know that there is some functionality that launches Vipers. We don't know that it's anything to do with the deck crew because we haven't done any. We haven't interviewed, you know, the the crew and gone, hey, how do you actually launch a Viper? But we know that we can see 
that vipers clearly are launched, and we can see that clearly they happen in result of something. So in this case, we could say, well, there is a command. And we know some bits of data that we collect. Another example of this would be registration. How do we register users? Well, we know that we collect email and password because that's on every wireframe. Where are we going to save it? How we save it? Do we tell compliance and so forth? We don't know yet. We can defer knowing that. So instead, though, we do know that there is a command that we're going to issue. And we're going to take the information from the request. We dump it onto the command bus. Now, the advantage of that is you're turning the controller back into just knowing about HTTP. It knows about a, one command, but really what it's doing is going, hey, I'm going to interrogate this request and use the data within it. You're in control of the command bus, so it's nice and easy to mock it. You can say, hey, the command bus threw an exception. Or did the command bus just go, yep, good job. Nice and easy breakpoint for your tests. Um, so you don't need to have any of the services. If you go and you had to write that back and you'd started with services, if something new came in, you would have to go back into every single controller that did it and change it over, which means you have to run your tests again, build. Maybe that's minor, but you know it's not great. We just did one single service. If we did that for three or four services, we're doing that over and over and over again, hmm. the command bus allows us to have it all in a handler away from our code. So the other advantage is, if you're doing front-end work, is you can just say, OK, well, now we can design this front-end. We'll, we can have the 404 page, or we can have success. We can just assume that the command handler appropriately behaves, and then we can go back and solve that later. So this application flow, internally within the teams at World First that use it, we call this the do-done cycle. Um, so basically, you're either your console command or your controller acts as your adapter, and then fires a command, do something, and just hands it to the command bus. Command bus then says, OK, this is the correct command handler to deal with this command. Then at that point, the handler will, will always have within it uh, an event bus and say, I've done something. That goes to the event bus, and then that may then generate more stuff itself. So here we are. We've got the commence FTL jump handler. Um, so we're going to spool up. We're going to handle the commence the FTL jump, and we're going to jump the battle star. We have some coordinates that come out of it. And we go, uh, we'll, we'll verify this with the navigation computer. Um, and if it's successful, we'll fire an event saying jump was successful. If not, we'll fire a jump was off course event. So then on the other side, we have a listener who's going, oh, right, OK, I'm listening for a, a bad jump event. When that happens, I'm going to take time to calculate as a plot device uh, the new coordinates, because they will fill several episodes with bad jumps. Uh, and then. This? Oh, this is another listener that says, OK, I'm going to handle the replot of the FTL jump command. I've actually just gone, the listener in this case doesn't do anything itself. It just uses the command bus itself. So you only have writing doing in command handlers. Your listeners then don't even do anything. They just appropriately generate a new command themselves. So this leads to this pattern where you can go, OK, a command will fire an event, which then, because there are maybe three, four listeners listening for that event, generate three commands themselves. Those then fire events, and then, of course, there may not be anything listening on two of those events. They might just be you're firing them, but you're logging them all, you know, to, to know that your application did something. And then one of those events is important, and so that then runs three commands, and they fire events, on and on and on. So. With this model, we use Action Domain Responder, which is a pattern that I first heard about uh, reading through the SLIM uh, framework documentation. There's a little bit in there. Um, it describes it as a web-specific refinement of the MVC pattern. 
um, and is like more suited to the closure-based micro frameworks. If you want to read up on it directly rather than just through the Swim documentation, here is the link to it. It's quite a useful pattern. The, the important stuff from it is MVC, Model View Controller, do we really have views anymore in the same sense? Do we have models like that in the same way? Whereas ADR uh, talks about actions, and it uses actions in the sense of, well, the Slim documentation talks about invocable callables. As you know, you just set up a little function and off you go. The domain, well, we've talked about domain logic in the sense of hexagonal architecture. And the responder, with the views being quite clever, there's, the, you know, you have conversations with front end devs and they say, don't dismiss the presentation logic of an application. There's important stuff going on in there, you know, and a lot of the uh, complexity in, say, JavaScript frameworks like Flux, of which, you know, they're clever, but let's not kid around. They are, they are more complex that for the first time user of it than we would like. So there is, some, there is some cunning going into our presentation logic. And so the responder is effectively handling all of that. The nice thing is that by having a separate responder, you can have responders specific to the mechanism. You can have an HTTP responder or a console responder. Or uh, for a queue, you might not say anything apart from, hey, uh, Synac, yeah, good job, this happened. Um, but you're, using, you're not using a view. It could be multiple views. Your idea of what a view is in MVC is probably going to be more complex than the examples of, that you see in a lot of you know, online documentation. You will want that complexity, and you will want a responder to handle that complexity. So taking ADR further, um, the easiest way to sort of describe this is using the commands in a useful kind of way to sort of cause this cascade of events. So in comes a request. OK, now we have an action. And the action is probably, well, we're going to use Slim for this example, I think. So all we're going to do is set up at forward slash that there is some index action. And we'll run it. OK, fine. Doesn't really do much. But it's going to fire off a command to the command bus. So here we go. This is uh, moving away from Battlestar because I was running out of episodes to watch. Um, this is check balance. It's made up. This is not real code. It's OK. It's OK, boss. Um, so uh, we throw into the constructor of it a command bus interface and a responder interface. In this case, we are certainly dealing with HTTP, so it's an HTTP responder interface. And again, it needs to be just a simple invocable, so we're going to take in the request. We're going to pull apart a, a UUID from the, the header and say, OK, there's, there's a user. And then we're just going to create a new check user balance command with that user ID and give it to the command bus. Nice and simple. Now we need a handler. And the handler is going to talk to a service or multiple services. It doesn't really matter at this point. Certainly, that you're, from the point of view of your action, it doesn't care. It's way over there. And this is your real domain logic here. This is the bit where you actually care about and the bit that you're going to be talking to your stakeholders about. So here we go. This is a simple check user balance handler. Uh, if ask an authorization service if they're authorized uh, with that user ID. I can guarantee our security model is a lot tighter than this, <laughs> just in case you're worried. Um, and we go, OK, yeah, you're authorized. You can now see a balance. So uh, let's emit an event onto the event bus a new user balance was checked event. And we're going to give it the balance for that user. So that event's now coming out. And so what is that? It's pretty simple. Again, it has the actual balance. It has 
Uh, the user ID, simple getters. That's now going onto an event bus. From the event bus, it's going to go to n number of listeners. And at this point, you can probably see where this is going. So, OK, we're going to listen, and we go, user balance was checked. But this has a balance responder inside it. Now, in this case, the balance responder and the HTTP responder interface are one and the same class. Because one cares about, hey, I'm for HTTP, and the other part of it, the other interface here, cares that it can accept a, a user's balance. So we're just going to say, hey, responder, update the user balance. Now, in reality, what's going to happen is that could be very complex. That could be uh, a whole twig templating system inside there going, oh, right, OK, well, if the user's balance is higher than 1,000, we give them a gold star. or It doesn't matter what it, what it is. It could be <laughs> anything, anything you want on there. Or there could be things like, oh, well, you've got uh, a negative balance, so we use this style sheet. We bring something to your attention, we, you know, which is not appropriate for an API or a command line. It is appropriate, though, for when you're looking at the site over HTTP. So the balance responder it takes care of that. And in fact, if you were testing this via a CLI, you would just get back, uh, I think you'd use write ln, and just say, hey, here's the user balance. But it would accept the same parameters. So OK, so now the listener's updated the responder, and now we get a response back. Nice and simple, or I hope so anyway. So in this example here, you know, we're, we're taking this, and once we've done all of this, we go this responder respond, which in this case returns a response interface. The domain doesn't know about any of that, didn't care or doesn't, isn't aware in any way that this is to do with HTTP. It doesn't know it's a PSR 7 responder, doesn't know any of that. It's just that these two are the same linked object. So it's nice and easy for us to switch out the action responder pair for any adapter. Uh, if you're doing testing, for example, you just have it, well, you're not interested actually in the output, generally speaking. You're not going to go, oh, well, is the style sheet looking appropriate or whatever like that. What you want to see is, does that responder have the data in it that the cycle of work from all of those listeners and events, does it actually do what it's supposed to do? So responders can be as smart or as dumb as you like in this pattern. You, you know, one of the things that you can do is, because you're listening, you have n number of listeners populating a responder. So you can start getting into like multiple events, iterating over a responder and building it up. So if user has logged in, is, you know, or user is authorized, well, I'm a responder that says, welcome, Barney. So all I do is I'm just going to tell the responder, hey, uh, welcome the user, or yes, they're logged in. The responder's role then is go, oh, well, I know that the heading on this page will have my name on it, or the customer name on it. But you don't care about that for the CLI, or maybe you do, but in a completely different way. So they can be smart, and they can be built up over time. Um, now, because your world, when you're moving through your app, is just commands and events, these are really small. Um, it's, so it fits well with CQRS. And going back to when we were talking about how uh, the patterns fit together nicely, or at least are not mutually exclusive. You can literally write for a lot of things on your domain map when you're going through and going, all right, we're going to do domain-driven design. You say, this is a command. Have it literally as, a, as code. And say, this is a command. Register this user. Check this balance. Move this money to here. And actually use that terminology so you're doing tell, don't ask within your system. So here inside the balance responder, in this case, uh, I'm taking a response interface. Uh, response interface, as you probably know, is immutable. So in this case, we're just going to add a, a header to it. We'll just say it's uh, an API. And it's just going to respond back with your balance in the response header. It could just as well be any of the other types I mentioned before. And the important thing is that because you're moving through your application with self-validating DTOs, these commands and events, 
you don't need to wait for a response from your command bus. Or you shouldn't get anything back from your command bus. Uh, instead, you're just going, OK, well, if I form this command, and I gave it to the command bus, and I want to use that data here and now, it must be valid, because the command bus didn't throw a big wobbly, or the event bus didn't throw you know, uh, an exception. Things must be working. So now I've, I've created a user ID, like a UUID. I've got that to hand. So that UUID must be valid. I can just respond directly. If I don't want to use a responder, I can just go directly back and say, hey, you're, here's your user ID. Well done. So it does sound complex. And I have some caveats. I don't actually have caveats. I really like the pattern. It's <laughs> Um, so, this is my first talk, and I've run it a little bit quicker than I expected, so I'd like to say thank you very much.